is a scarcity in cross-cultural fluency. Um, and I think that hasn't really hit a lot of literature in kind of the Western world of to be able to talk to a Nigerian or to be able to talk to someone in Afghanistan, to be able to, obviously no one's gonna know every culture, but the the fluency to be able to begin to to have these big blocks of what Charity was saying, that people are made in the image of God, therefore their culture is like a library that you look for assets that are distinct to that culture, you look for liabilities that are distinct to it, and you assume that they're made in the image of God and that there's that there's something there for the counselor, for the ambassador, for whomever to, to discover. Welcome to the Feast Over Famine podcast. On this podcast, we're navigating the tension that we find where mission and profit collide. We're talking to CEOs, founders, executive directors, impact investors, and all of what we've identified as the global ecosystem of the social enterprise, business for transformation, business as mission landscape. We're talking to them about the obstacles they face, the strategic challenges they've been through, how they're funded, how they were started, and everything that's happened in between. We are trying to share their story in a way that's impactful to help us all to grow the social enterprise space for the better. Enjoy this week's episode with your host, Ryan Mahaffey. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another week of the Feast Over Famine podcast. We're stoked you guys are here, and I'm super stoked for this week's episode. We've got Stephen and Charity Jones uh, out of the UK uh, to talk about Kairos counseling and the awesome stuff that they're doing. Uh, we met them about a year ago and um, have just been able to see them grow this year. And yeah, I'm really excited for them to share their their heart and their story and what they're doing. So guys, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. I'm excited you're here. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah, totally. So let's let's start with a little bit of your guys' story. Um, so I think that's that's where a lot of this like bursts from, right? So tell me, I guess let's just kind of start at the beginning. Like, how did you guys end up um, in the UK in the therapy field? Like, you know, some of that backstory. I guess that starts with me. <laughs> um, so straight out of uni, I decided to um, travel and thought I wanted to work kind of somewhere overseas. Um, ended up in long story, but ended up in the Middle East and was studying Arabic. And while there, um, just realized that something that just was kind of pervasive was a lot of uh, mental health needs, a lot of psychosomatic um, symptoms from trauma that just was pervasive. And um, I had a lot of friends personally, but just kind of everywhere around me. And I I didn't know much about counseling or psychology, even though that was my degree, (laughs) but I knew enough to know that, hey, they need help. Where's the help? And there wasn't much. There were other workers kind of in that area of the world that had some lay counseling experience, but a lot of times they would end up just giving them a Bible verse. And for people where 99% of the population is Muslim, that uh, that was not helpful um, at best, um, harmful a lot of times. And, um, but just really just ignorance. And there wasn't very much there, there were psycho, this was, you know, 20 years ago. So there were some psycho psychologists or maybe some psychiatrists, but it was mostly for the very, very wealthy. Um, but certainly most people had nothing, um, and didn't even have the framework for it. And so I just, I decided, okay, this is, what I want to do, but I need more training. So that took me back to the States because there wasn't a lot overseas to get access to higher training in that area. Um, And so I went back to the States and did a master's in counseling, which is where I met Stephen. And then our story took circuitous route. We ended up in Southern Spain for a while um, where I would say we were doing, we both were trained as counselors at that point. And um, I had been licensed because I had spent some time working in the States. Um, but I would say we were doing more informal counseling and trauma work um, with a lot with North Africans. Um, and then we um, kind of other things happened in our story and that moved us to London. Um, and uh, yeah, we just, <laughs> when we arrived, that was over six years ago now, mm-hmm. six and a half years ago. Um, within the first year, I just started 
from connections, I've kept up with some of my counseling and my, my license and everything. And so just some connections, people said, Hey, I need someone to see a counselor, but I don't know any good ones. You know, do you know anyone or would you be willing to see someone? And so um, I started taking a few clients just, just because yeah. um, just as a favor, <clears throat> but uh, as I started looking into it and kind of thinking, do I really want to have a full caseload, um, especially with trauma clients? I thought the most I'm ever going to see are 20, 25 clients and with high level of trauma, that would be a lot. Yeah. Um, and I was, you know, a young mom and had kids yeah. running around. So I knew I couldn't do that at the time, but I thought even if I get to that place, um, in a city of 8 million plus people, um, that's a drop in the bucket. And right. I just thought, well, where are the, there, there is, you know, starting to ask, there's a gap for counseling in general, in general, mental health counseling, um, trauma counseling in particular. Um, but Christian, like highly trained Christian counselors, um, even more so, and it's growing and developing, but just really there is a gap. And so I started thinking, well, what if I could facilitate a way to bring counselors who are trained and qualified, but then they can be reaching out to our community and our community is very, um, you know, there's a lot of stigma. There's a lot of barriers to mental health counseling beyond just the lack of access to it. So, um, our heart had been to, you know, bring counselors who had a heart for understanding the cultures they would be working in, not mm -hmm. just bringing their version of Western counseling, particularly with Americans <laughs> of, you know, yeah. like, Oh, that's great. I know how to do this with this, you know, Westerner that looks like me, that talks like mm -hmm. me and, mm -hmm. um, you know, grew up in the places I grew up having to really, really understand the people they were with and live with them and do life with them and have that sh shift. Some of the ways they, they understood the good frameworks they've been trained in, but, um, it shifts a lot, a, a lot, how we would work with someone. So anyway, that's what yeah, no, that's we super, <laughs> I've, I'm taking notes here of like 15 questions that I have. So like going <laughs> kind of backing up then, like, let's just talk about when you're in the middle East a little bit and you started to notice like, you know, and for a lot of people who, you know, I think in general in the, in Western culture, there's like a stigma around counseling. Like it's, it's still there, but I think that's changing. I think yeah. it's becoming something that's yeah. more celebrated. Like I'm someone who's just, I think everyone needs to go to counseling at least once before they're 30, because we all just, I think it's just super valuable. And then probably in every major life transition from then on, it's super important. So, but I think that like that took me time. Like I remember the first time I went to counseling, I was like, I don't know if I want to tell people about this. Like, I just kind of want to keep this over here kind of thing. So there's like the Western version of that. Right. But we're probably even further along unpack or like peel back the layers on the, when you were in the middle East and even, um, even maybe not then, but just even culturally now, like unique to some of those cultures, like what, what is under the surface that's causing some of that. And, and kind of with that, like when you think of, we'll just say people doing humanitarian work, like you, whatever reason brought you to the middle East, some people go for humanitarian work or some people might go for missions or different things. Um, when they're doing that, they might not have a counseling background, but they're hitting all these like traumatic things or cultures that have been ripped apart with civil war or, or different things happening. And they're running into head on in that without experience, I guess, peel back some of that whole piece of it a little bit more for me. Yeah. Oh, that's a lot. Um, well, let me say this. I think when I went, I had a pretty strong sense of who I was. I was a pretty confident person. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I went to a, a pretty good university, so I just had a lot of things that I would have said, you know, like, I like who I am. I think I, yeah. you know, um, and I myself experienced a lot while there that really started to strip away some of my identity. Um, and it was really hard. I mean, I got to the point where I was like, why am I even born? Um, hmm. and, and, I, but at the same time I was like, but I, I come with like a father and two older brothers that love me and a, a church community that always supported and encouraged me and empowered me as, as a woman, but as a person and, um, you know, helps along the way. And even I can get to this place. And I looked around at a lot of the people around me, both men and women, um, that were in these, um, I think systems where, uh, there, there, there are pervasive patterns. So there are beautiful things in their culture, but there were some pervasive patterns. And, um, 
I think one of the things that I think in terms of counseling, if, if you think of it as like, oh, I need counseling, I need a help, or I need, I have mental health, you know, problems or illness or something, that's a really scary thing. But if you think of it more as, you know, God designed us in his image and, um, you know, that's been broken, it's been marred. And one of the things that he's called us to in his story is to not just redeem us and save us, but to restore that image and help us understand mm-hmm. Um, which the start of that is beginning to acknowledge and give voice to the ways that we've been harmed. Um, so I think it's really about beginning to give voice or uh, see ways to help people understand that they have dignity just by being a human being. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. That how they are made, God made them good. Like he made them in his image. And, and, and there are so many beautiful things in them, I think, um, so when you think in terms of culture, I think in the West, we kind of think individual, you know, I'm, you know, self-esteem that, you know, that's a big one, a self-esteem, like work on your self-esteem if you believe you're good. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's some truth in that, but I think at a, at a bigger level that if you think systematically, we, we were designed, all of us humans in his image and then designed to relate to each other. Mm-hmm. So I think that some of the patterns that I saw kind of in some of those cultures is that you kind of uh, misuse the system, misuse power in the system, but because you're trying to get what you, what the good desires that are behind that, you know, you want, um, I think it's beginning to see the, what were the things that be curious about the, the things that were, were good about that system or that culture um, that's good, but you're, you're ha- trying to have it met in ways that, um God didn't design and ends up harming you and harming those yeah. around you. And then, then you have generations of that. So um, I think particularly in, you know, some of the Eastern cultures, family is very important. Um, and so uh, when family is broken, which they're not for, they're not for, I think we sometimes have this picture that they just want to, you know, be power hungry. And that's not necessarily true, but when it is broken, honor is so important um Hmm. and you don't want to bring shame to the family that sometimes they will not voice or not expose the wrong where you know it can be stepped in and and work to heal that um because you're afraid of the shame that that would bring so the cost of the shame is higher than than the cost to the harm that it's doing and then over generations that kind of grows. And so there's a lot of hidden, um, just a lot of hidden. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's why it came out psychosomatically is because that's the, you know, the, you know, the body keeps the score, Bessel van der Kolk for anybody that knows trauma. <laughs> um, he talks about the body keeps the score. The body is going to speak somehow. Um, hmm. If it can't give voice, you know, through the emotions, through naming it and articulating it, is going to give voice somehow. And, and so it will come out physically. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know if I answered the question in terms no. of patterns, particularly. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's yeah. helpful. Um, and so you're seeing all that stuff and saying like, okay, well, what do we do? Talk to me about like where the, where the current like therapy or counseling industry, we'll call it falls short in ways of serving that culture. So either, you know, when you were there, obviously you weren't saying, well, there's already a hundred counselors in this area or therapists in this area um, doing this work. You said there's a need here um, for people experiencing these kinds of things. Where did the current, why why were people not doing that? Or um, if the people were there doing it, what was like, what was the miss there? Maybe that's just like an education thing. Like there were opportunities to get trained. Uh, Maybe like you were saying, some people were there and they're just giving a Bible verse, but I guess you're, you're noticing a need. And then in order to start an organization, you have to say there's a need and no one's solving that need. So we're going to go do it differently. Talk to me about the, like, no one's doing it. So we need to do something piece of that. Mm. Yeah. I mean, Hmm. I don't know if it's that, yeah, I, I want to be careful. I don't want to say that no one is doing it because I'm sure other people have thought that mm-hmm. it's not like I'm the brainchild of this. Um, 
<laughs> but I, I think that there, Steven thinks there so. is a, <laughs> there's, there's, um, I think there's a gap in, um, hmm, maybe a different way to say it is like this. When, when I, so after I finished in the Middle East, I spent two years there, but I mean, I was living, breathing everything. I spoke fluent Arabic at the time. People thought I was from Lebanon because of my skin coloring and um, my accent was so on point, right? But also because I'd really just done life all the time with friends around me. Um, and so when I had, um, and then I spent the summer in London following that actually, um, kind of working with the same people groups, but in London. And um, they, there, there was like a trust that they had for me that they didn't have for other uh, Westerners that, you know, I would say are similar to me and in, in who they are, but because they knew I, and they said a few times, like, you know, you know us, like you understand this. So there's these unspoken sort of understandings. Um, and I think especially in, in the culture I worked with, a lot of things that will happen to women, the ways that you have to sort of um, change how <laughs> It's not so much change how you look a little bit, but like, you know, not talking to a man, you know, looking eye to eye, right? right. Like keeping mm -hmm. your eyes down um, because that's the way of honoring them and respecting. And, and so kind of seeing that there's, there's a respect there, there's a goodness of wanting to show respect and honor, but then there's a misuse of that where if you don't do that, then um, they feel at liberty to hurt you and mm -hmm. say it's your fault, mm -hmm. <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. Um, so stuff like that, where it's, you could go in from a Western point of view and say, oh, well, we have to, you know, women power and we have to bring the feminist movement, which there are some good things in that. Right. But, but the, 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 um, idea of wanting to honor and respect your husband or your father or, um, your elder in your church or your mosque or whoever, you know, that's not a bad thing. That's actually right. a really good thing. And yeah. um, it's something we're called to actually. And so it's not just coming in and saying, well, you know, you, you just have to stand up for your rights and, you know, and break all ties because the impact of that is going to be, you're leaving them alone. This is mm -hmm. their whole world mm -hmm. and they will not have that world anymore. And do you, are you prepared to offer all those supports? No. So how do you begin to invite them to name, give voice to that? Um, but not necessarily saying um, you you want to be sensitive and careful with how you go about doing that and who you're inviting yeah. into that. So it may be involving some of the family in that more um, or uh, inviting simple ways that they might show honor while they're also beginning to give voice. And, and is there a way to give voice in a respectful way that's not necessarily um, just stand up for your rights? Um, and, and sometimes it may be to, to speak up and there's a cost with that. And it, so, but, and, and I want to be careful too, cause it's not like if you've lived there, if you understand them, you're going to know everything. I, maybe I have some taste, but, um, it's, it's, it's that I have to come kind of saying, I'm learning, not just this person in front of me, which is what you would do in a, in a counseling room, but also I need to really understand that there's more to the culture they're in, which mm. we should do, but I think we yeah. make a lot of assumptions yeah. in the West. So, um, yeah. I mean, not in the West, yeah. I think everybody makes assumptions. Like you kind of make assumption. This is how this works. Um, but I think you said something recently about this, that someone you were working with, that there was, you, you just realized that there was so much more, um, in, in terms of what they're coming in with. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's it's interesting because oftentimes in the West, you go to counseling to know who to cut out of your life. Yeah. And and, and, and the other people in, in the East, you go to the counseling to know how to bear the burden of the people that are in your life. Mm. It's just a different, and, and there's so many different assets that Africans or uh, Asians or Middle Easterners, they come, you know, it talks about, you know, it takes a village to raise a child. You know, there's a, there's an assumption, or I even read sometime, somewhere at one point that um, if a Kenyan comes into money, there are 183 people that would be linked and have feel a right to that money. Yeah. Some, and then in America, it's like three or five or something. Yeah. Like the, 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 yeah. the, the association 
of assets are huge. It's so many people that you could call on, but um, the, the Western model is to make your to make your circle smaller and get rid of all the toxic people. While I think in the East or in Africa, it's you suck out the venom yourself. You know, that's mm-hmm. how you save the community mm-hmm. is that you you take on the responsibility of others or you you try to um, find out how you can kind of leverage your yourself in order to uh, in order to to give yeah. life to the issues. Well, and neither of those is necessarily better or worse. It's just saying, well, like glo- if you look at it globally, we need to approach it all differently. Right. And I think my assumption would be a lot of the places to get training and get licensed and get school and a master's in psychology and all these things like those are Western institutions. Most of them, there's probably some, we'll say Eastern or developing world kind of ones, but most of them are are Western. And so we're, we're training probably people from that mindset, which means it's going to take a unique perspective, like what you guys have to go serve where the majority of the world's population is. And to go back to charity, what you're saying about like just the inherent worth of, of human and like dignity of a human, like if a large percentage of the world population is living there, they have equal trauma in different ways than those in the West, but that is much more available in the West. So like we should bring that, um, but we have to do it in a unique and, and kind of special way to do that. So I, I think it's awesome. Like just hearing you guys talk about it, like it's something we've seen. Um, uh, we had a client in, I'll just say the horn of Africa um, to be <laughs> a little careful um, on security, but, uh, and they were explaining the honor shame culture there. And, you know, I think for most most Westerners or Americans and stuff, you hear honor, shame culture, and you think like Japan is kind of the stereotypical one of that maybe. Um, and, and this individual was saying like, it was, it was my country before the world. Right. And then it was, uh, my clan and there's different clans in that country before my country. And then my sub clan before my clan. And then my, uh, my kind of large family before my sub clan. And then my immediate family before that, my, brother before my mother, father, whatever, all the way down to me before my spouse. So it was, a uh, in, as they were growing to learn that culture is an interesting blend of like this very much, I'm going to serve everybody and be my country versus the, the world in that sense, all the way down to in the right situation, I would be against my spouse or my kid because I'm it's, it was this interesting blend of individualization mixed with, um, kind of that typical, like, what you're saying, Stephen, global version of that. And so I just think it's different in every single culture. And so I, I guess, you know, um, maybe this is a good transition because I, I think transitioning to what you guys are doing now and the, the people within London that you guys have found um, relationships and what your kind of model looks like is really good. But you guys couldn't do that for every single culture because that, that place in the Horn of Africa is going to be different than the Japanese culture is different than Pakistan. You know, there might be some similarities of like Western culture versus Eastern culture, but man, you'd have to be an expert in every single one of those individual cultures in the history of it and that people group to even, you know, and, and then maybe even like a specific tribe of that people group, that's going to be different. Um, and so I just, I don't know if you guys have any, like, maybe I'm just talking and you guys are like, yep, we agree. <laughs> that's summing it up or if you have <laughs> thoughts on that, but uh, you know, maybe some thoughts on that if you have any, and then I'd like to transition to what is it that this has all turned into today? So we kind of have heard your story and stuff, but like, where are you at on, on that today? What does that look like? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that there is a scarcity in cult- cross-cultural fluency. Um, and I think that hasn't really hit a lot of literature in kind of the Western world of to be able to talk to a Nigerian or to be able to talk to someone in Afghanistan, to be able to, obviously, no one's going to know every culture but the the fluency to be able to begin to to have these big blocks of what charity was saying that people are made in the image of god therefore their culture is like a library that you look for assets that are distinct to that culture you look for liabilities that are distinct to it and you assume that they're made in the image of god and that there's that there's something there for the counselor for the ambassador for whomever to to discover so That's, I think I just think to throw approach, something in, like how much more of a burden as a therapist is that, right? Like if I go to someone down the street here in Denver, 
that culturally gets it. They studied here. Like I look like the typical mountain living millennial that has all the same issues as every other one, right? Like to a degree, right? I'm, I'm being somewhat funny, but like, and, and maybe this is a good transition. Like you guys moved to London to do this. Like what a cultural melting pot. It wasn't like you said, wow, we're going to really go in depth on the Pakistani culture and move to Pakistan and like serve people there. Like you, you guys are in like a melting pot of all sorts of cultures and it's, I love your term, Stephen, of like a library, like that is just a tremendous burden to say, okay, I not only have this, like Charity, you said this um, human in front of me to learn, I have this different culture to learn on top of it, which is probably even more time consuming. So I could just imagine the, the average caseload being three to five times more like time and, and complexity as a result of like doing that for multiple cultures. Yeah. I mean, it's not, yes, I think that's true. It's not, if you're thinking, oh, I think I'll be a counselor and I'll just go with people overseas. It's not, it's not that easy. I mean, you're not being called to, we spoke about this earlier, but, um, you know, I, I will, uh, quote Diane Langberg a lot, but she's, you know, she encourages you to your Jesus is calling you to bear witness, right? So to bear witness, you have to really like know someone and know their story and know things that come from. So yes, it's a lot of work. It's not like, Oh, this is going to be, um, you know, easy, you know, I'll check off my list and I'm done. And, and yeah. when you start to hear some of the depth of wounds in their story, um, it's very hard to, to, yeah, it's very hard to do. There's, I, I was something that you were saying earlier with, um, kind of, that having that fluency that Stephen was saying, the fluency, I think it's true. It's not, we're never going to be able to, I'm never going to be able to know someone's total story. And even if I did, <laughs> even if I somehow totally knew, I still need to know this is a person. I, I don't know their thoughts. I don't know how they're responding. So, but it's a, it's maybe a posturing towards them and it's coming um, in a trained way. You're, you're training and you're recognizing um, there was a really great book um, called, I think it's called honor and shame by Roland Mueller, where he sort of talks about there's three frameworks for how we view the world. There's in the West, it's the guilt and innocent. Um, in the, in a lot of Eastern cultures, it's honor, shame. And then particularly, I think in sub-Saharan Africa, it's, um, power, fear. power and fear. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that's kind of what orients sort of your, your, your kind of your triggers and then how you're going to move out with people. Now, it doesn't mean the other things don't exist, but that's just generally. And one of the things that really shifted for me very early on before I ever did my counseling training was realizing even the Bible, you can read it from whatever yeah. framework you're coming from. So, uh, and a lot of the church fathers who write about the Bible came from a guilt, innocent, they're lawyers. A lot of them were, Augustine was lawyers, you know, so um, just kind of even how we approach the Bible, but that, that the Bible is not in a certain framework. It's, yeah. you know, God, God comes to us. And so when you start to change, okay, if I was going to look at it from, from an honor, shame framework, or from a fear power framework, what does that say? And mm. all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, there's how like did a whole I miss this story thing? there. I yeah. Right. So I think it's that posturing towards people of, it's not that, um, it's not that there's a, I'm ever going to fully like embody that, but I, a posturing towards like, okay, if I'm beginning to hear it from their story and their framework and understand a bit how that plays out, um, I'm going to start to hear things that I never would have heard before. Right. Yeah. So I think that's what we're that's trying cool. to do. And I think with Kairos in particular and what God's just done in this last year is um, I, I, what really excites me is that is not just kind of the clients that we're reaching into, but the counselors that he's bringing us. Um, so you're right. I'm never going to understand all these cultures, but we now have three uh, counselors that are from Asian backgrounds, various Asian backgrounds, speak various languages, they're trainees. And so I'm like, well, we can empower them to be, able to, <laughs> they're going to be able to speak something into people's world in a totally different way than, than I will ever be able to, even if I, as much as I'm able to kind of understand and know somebody's culture. So that's, that's an, kind of another um, arm of this that has been an yeah. exciting part of where we are now, but um, maybe Stephen can talk about where we are in terms of. 
Yeah. And Steven, I did interrupt you because I wanted to make a point earlier. I finished your thought from earlier too, because I was like, what you were saying was gold and I wanted to make sure we (laughs) grasped it. Oh, I don't Um, remember. The things I say just sort of come and and I go, but (laughs) I mean, I think, I think one of the things that seems to be, um, part of the counseling process that, you know, like you talk about yourself as a very uh, normal uh, Denver millennial. But I think one of the luxuries of working cross-culturally is that um, you can make no, you can make no assumptions. <laughs> and so if you, if you or another Denverite, if that's how you say it, go into a, and, and, and they make $74,000 a year and they come from a broken family, you can't, <laughs> you can't do the math, right? Yeah. Like you can't, yeah. you can't make it a formula because it, there, there's a false assumption of familiarity when you go to somebody who looks like you and has the same accent and who might make the same amount of money. Um, but the great thing about working with, um, so right now we're working in about 10 different countries because the, the vast majority of counseling we do is online. And, um, oh, and so people just sort of find us from, you know, like I get this rural person in the UK saying, Hey, my, my, I'm, I'm connected to my archbishop. And he said that he said that he was checked. I've never met the archbishop. No one in Kairos has ever met the archbishop or we get someone from sub-Saharan Africa or, you know, East Asia, and they just kind of find us. Um, And the luxury is, is that I can go slow and I can check my assumptions, check my assumptions. And it's sort of hilarious in in the process of like i get it wrong i get it wrong i get it wrong and there's this turn in the conversation of we're starting to look through glasses that are similar and so obviously it's never going to be the same but um one of the reasons why i'm jealous for westerners for londoners for americans for south americans to whomever to work with us is because if we have you know let's say we have a farsi speaker an arabic speaker a spanish speaker a french speaker and we all are in the same conversation and, and working off of each other in this yeah. sort of melting pot of wisdom, then you can teach each other not only the, the, the French culture, for instance, but also the assumptions and the assets that the French culture sort of uniquely brings. Mm. So um, mm. one of the exciting things for me is, is that um, on the one hand, I think if I lived in a relatively homogenous society, I might get bored or I might think I can sort of do control C, control V, just copy and paste yep. my yep. like six steps yep. of, to grief. Um, but if you can sort of say, oh, in this culture, you know, everybody comes to my house for 10 days and they move in when someone dies. Like, okay, what's that like? Right. <laughs> because in the right. American culture, you want to leave people alone because we we have sort of made sacred the time of aloneness and that we are the most ourselves when we are alone. While that's not our cultural assumption in yeah. the majority of the history of, of the cultures in the world. Yeah. So. Well, it's cool to hear some of the growth. So where you guys are at now, you've got three therapists on staff. They're all of some some form of Asian descent, plus you guys. They're three trainees. Three trainees. Okay. And you guys are basically online. You're, you're in London um, in a predominantly uh, Asian descent area. And now you, you mentioned before, I forget how you worded it, but it was, it was South Asian mainly. So can you clear, as we say, like, I think as Westerners, we hear Asian and we're like, okay, these are like Chinese or Japanese or South Korean or something like that. Can you clarify like the Asian descent? Yeah, Asian in the UK, actually, most people in the UK hear Asian and they think India. Um, okay. India, Asian is South Asian, really, but um, so it's India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, um, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Sri Lankan um, is generally the um, kind of the predominant countries that are pulling from. So yeah, in, in London, you have about a million South Asians. Some of that is the British Empire and the close relationship with India. There's a there's a long history behind it, but because it's such a it's such a dominant culture in so about London is about fifty uh, percent foreign born, um, but you know in our children's schools there's a very high percentage of just a very a lot of different cultures and uh, like like when we moved here people when they walked up to us they just assumed we were Polish and would start speaking Polish to us so um, <laughs> love it yeah no it's cool and I mean it's cool that you guys can take everything we've talked about so far of like your heart for this and your even your expertise that's like coming out in this conversation in this 
and move to a city that gives you access to all of that. And then now with COVID happening and all that, now you can do some of that online now, and that's going to create its own probably scaling challenge for you guys, where you get start getting these international referrals and like, well, they kind of fit. And so there'll be some fine tuning that I'm sure you guys have to do over the, over the years of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess like from a, um, nonprofit mission heart, like what we're seeking to accomplish. You know, if you guys were uh, a for-profit, you know, fully for-profit and you were just like, Hey, this is our career. We want to make a ton of money and this is a good way to do it or whatever. That's not fully the angle you guys are taking. Although I think that's good to make money and provide for yourselves and your family. But like, what's the overarching umbrella, like mission of this thing, you know, um, of saying, wow, look what we've learned. Look at the need, look what we're doing today. Here's what we're pushing for your guys' vision for that. What does that part look like? I think our goal is to be intentional about making counseling available to and accessible for cultures that it hasn't had that. So that's the heart behind it. Um, and in the midst of that, yes, we would like it to be sustainable and running without necessarily depending on donations. We want to employ South Asian or, well, we just want to employ counselors who are qualified that have that heart, have that, um, you know, posture towards um, the people around them, but are trained and can are going to actually help people, not um, just jump in and give them Bible verse. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah, so yeah. I think that that's that's the goal. Um, we are trying to figure out how to make that happen in a in a way that is um, we we don't lose the heart, but it is sustainable, and so. Um, yeah, I think that's, we have volunteer counselors currently. Um, and then the trainee is because they're tr in training, they're not being paid yet. But at some point in the next couple of years, we want to move to employing counselors and, um, but still making it accessible to the cultures around us. So, um, well, it seems like there's kind of two, two angles of that, you know, there's the making it accessible to people that haven't normally had that. And then there's the, um, it's not just about getting therapists so that you guys can scale. It's saying there's not enough therapists that are focused in this mindset and thinking about it this way. So like you guys have a responsibility to kind of build the army of people working on that kind of thing, you know? Um, so there's yeah. almost a thought leadership piece of what you guys are doing that I think is, is yeah. coming, like thought leading and saying, Hey, like, let's go to Denver seminary or somewhere and say, Hey, if you're wanting to do this, like if you're interested in this, like come train under us and get licensed under us, ideally we'd pay you and all that, but you're kind of moving people to think this way. And you're also having to do thought leadership on the side of making it accessible because just because people it's accessible at the right price point and it's available, that doesn't mean that those cultures are going to jump at it. Like those might not even be the yeah. two main pain points. Like the main pain point might be just their own site, like approach to therapy and what they think they need and, and the honor shame piece, all those things we've talked about, like you guys almost have to do the hard work to get people to understand that and then remove the barriers of cost and accessibility on that front. So it's not an easy task in that sense. Um, yeah. And in line with that, we are trying to partner. So I think we see us not as just this separate entity. We've never really wanted to be just on our own. We want to partner with like-minded communities. So we want mm -hmm. to come alongside and support where we see there is good community or there is understanding culturally, there is good healthy relating happening. So, um, so you're right. The, the idea of that is one, it, it makes us a trusted source for those communities for them to refer people in. So which it does happen. Like that is kind of how it happens in these cultures is that yeah. if they are going to be pushed over the edge, it's because someone told them you can trust these, these people. So yeah. that we do want to build a, a kind of an organization where yes, because we're a trusted name um, and then they can trust whatever counselor within it that they might yeah. see. Um, but yes, it comes alongside also though, making it, um, accessible financially, which COVID has been helpful because everything's gone remote. Um, and that's yeah. always now going to be an option. Although we do see some still face-to-face -face and we've done groups. Groups is another thing that, that I think we will push into more that is, a, um, it's something we do in Western cultures, but I think it is actually, um, it's, it's more, you know, because you're relating with others and you're learning from everyone. And it's not just coming to some expert who says, this is what you need to do. Um, 
I think it's much more powerful and, and effective long term. The, the downside, though, of the trusted communities is that um, one of the difficulties in these cultures is that there's a fear that, you know, if something gets out, it's going to go to everybody. And so yeah. it's sort of like yeah. you're kind of working it at, at both at the same time, it's like building and showing like this really will be trusted. That this won't be talked about. Um, but uh, you know, also to say, but it's a good thing. And right. so that right. we, sometimes you're right. It's like, a how do we, how do we market who we are, but we can't necessarily give, you know, championing stories of like, <laughs> right. you know, yeah, your friend down the street, like this happened with them. So yeah, it's, it's tough. Yeah. But, but the friend down the street might go tell their friends, you know, but especially if you guys are, especially if you guys are doing a good job, like if you guys are counseling well and people are really having that growth and they're saying, wow, like I know this neighbor down the street is going through something similar and it's their, their health is worth it to me to potentially experience that little bit of shame that comes with it. Like that would be, you know, that, um, vulnerability is the word that I'm looking for. Yeah. It's like, it creates a willingness to be vulnerable for the sake of the other person. And if that's happening well, so I, and I think that'll happen. Um, and I'm excited about what you guys are doing. I think it's really cool. All right, everyone. I want to take a quick break from today's episode and just share a little bit about impact foundation. Who's got an incredibly awesome model of using impact investment, charitable dollars, and funding tons of projects all over the world right now. What if your investments could change the world? At Impact Foundation, they believe business with purpose has the power to transform society. Purpose built for impact investing, Impact Foundation provides a streamlined way to fund businesses that seek social and spiritual transformation or make loans to charity, all while earning a financial return to grow your giving. Donors and investors have already supported more than 200 redemptive enterprises through their impact accounts. They provide needed fuel for companies that exist as a force of God's redemptive work in the world. To learn more about what they're doing in their kingdom impact investing model, visit impactfoundation.org. I think it's, I think it's helpful actually, as you think, as you talk about pain points, because kind of <clears throat> the assumptions um, that are normal, both in the classroom, like I think of the, the university classroom in the U S but also the counseling it's like, check your culture and your religion at the door and have an open mind. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was reading this dissertation by this, um, this uh, Pakistani woman who was talking about some of the, the pitfalls in uh, British counseling for her, for her culture of Pakistani Muslim background. And she says, Pakistani Muslims really shouldn't go to counseling in Britain because they are so, they are so uh, intolerant of our religion and our culture that we can't go to it. So it's been interesting. So my, in, 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 in Britain, I would say that I'm trained as a vicar. In America, I'd say I'm trained as a pastor. And I've, I've worked as a pastor, you know, for the last 12 years in a lot of ways. And, mm-hmm. and doing counseling has been something that's been um, kind of an addition and on the side to, to kind of normal pastoral uh, responsibilities. But it's been interesting how much that being a pastor is something that's sought after. And even if someone is not from kind of a, a religious background, necessarily, there's some sort of credence to it. And uh, people will explicitly say, I want to talk about my culture and I want to talk about religion. Are you going to be OK with that? Hmm. Um, because that, that those are two kind of like a stool. Those are like two, <laughs> two legs yeah. of the stool. So can yeah. we please be sure? Like, I want to I want to talk to somebody who can talk about those things. And if I can't talk about them, I won't talk to those people. So well, I don't I don't think that's abnormal. Like, I. You know, I don't think it's abnormal for a Christian in the U.S. to say, like, I would like some form of biblical counseling to be integrated in what Mm -hmm. I'm doing. So to then, you know, to then have a different expectation of somebody else, I think, you know, I think that's, yeah, there's a whole other podcast episode there that we could probably press into. (laughs) Um, But but, 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 but having having time, like one of the things that we're just realizing in terms of the number of people that are kind of reaching out, we've had a lot of referrals recently. As Christmas comes up, there's sort of a, there's kind of an upswing in people seeking out for mental health. But I think one of the things that I'm excited about is, is that we're going to start, you know, Lord willing in the future, if things continue to grow, is that we would see an upswing near Diwali, or we'd see an upswing near Ramadan, or we'd see an upswing near yeah. like Chinese New Year. Mm-hmm. Like as, 
as the cultures are integrated and we're beginning to kind of chart, mm. oh, what does Ramadan do? Like, what is what does Diwali do? What does Christmas do? And to be able to put people in strategic positions to say, you know what, we need a lot of Farsi speakers this time because there's a big cultural event coming mm. around. Yeah. And now that we have a margin available for our Farsi speaking um, uh, counselors. So I think the pain points is really interesting thinking about it both uh, around a particular culture, but also in kind of a global well, and, yeah. and with That's global, cool. I mean, back to COVID, it made it more accessible in terms of remote, but also accessible in terms of everybody knows everybody is struggling. So at some yeah. level, it removes a little yeah. bit of the stigma, even in these other cultures, because they're kind of like, no one can hide this anymore. So, yeah. Um, yeah. so that, you know, that's, that's, if you're, if talking about a pain point globally, you know, it's easy to land on, you know, if you just need to process, or if you need to grieve some of these losses that you've had Mm -hmm. i mean you're kind of okay with your children doing that you talk about it so it's okay for you to do that you know so it it like makes it it evens the board a little bit Mm. so it's not so much this mental health or Mm. um professional or even a western thing it's sort of like well this is everywhere actually yeah and it's created it's created a market in some way as well like i'm a tall guy i'm i'm six two and uh, I was doing a, a, bit, a bit of a paper for growing accessibility. And uh, I had one of my interviewees say, Stephen, I would never, I would never be alone with you in a room because I'm uh, a big person. But yeah. she said, online, of course. Yeah, fine. And, and for a lot of people, the stigma of walking into a counseling agency is taken away. The, and so like you can close the door behind you. You can put on a, you know, you can, you can put on a, a yep. Netflix show for your kid. Yeah. And so you, t- you, you increase accessibility, you increase the number of people you willing to see, you take away some of the threat, take away some of the fear. In a lot of ways, you can take out a lot of the friction for the clients or, or yeah. for the buyer uh, to, to access the product right. in a way that can be safer. Like you can be in the room with, you know, while your while your husband or while your wife is is in the other room, mm. if, if there's decent walls, you know. Yeah. Um, so it just <laughs> yeah. it, it creates like a whole new, it almost like a new product. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm actually again another full podcast episode. I'm actually really intrigued to see what happens with that um, because I I think it creates a the value of that is that it creates a new product, like you're saying. And man, there's so many more people with access to it now that don't have it just like telemed, I mean, telemedicine, you know, there's people that are older that can't make it to a doctor. Like, I think there's so much good to come from it. And at the same time, like there's so much to be said for walking into that counseling office and the ambiance and the setting that you guys like are experts in creating and having another human in front of you doing that thing that like we can, there's the negative side of that is that our ability to hide behind screens. Now we step with social media and all this stuff. And that's that another mm-hmm. layer of it. Whereas when you're in front of a human, like it's just different. So I'm intrigued, like the five, 10 year timeline of like what the COVID shift to zoom, like how that plays out and you know, if, mm-hmm. how the pendulum just keeps like swinging as we figure it out, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot more in-person meetings now than I have for the past couple year and a half. And I'm like, Oh man, what's the right balance for me? Like, because when I do a full day of them now, I'm exhausted. Whereas it wouldn't be abnormal for me to do 10 coffee meetings in a day a couple of years ago. And, um, and then when I do 10 Zoom meetings, I, they used to be like, wow, that was great. And now I'm like, man, that's exhausting. So I think there's, everyone has to figure out where they land. But then I think we're going to see some, maybe like, you know, just cultural pieces where it's like, hey, this is like a good, these are some good guardrails for how to handle it. And everyone's somewhere in between here. And I don't know if we mm. figured that out, but I think, and access to the internet is going to be something for you guys too. Like as more organiz like if Elon Musk gets internet or Mark Zuckerberg, whoever it's going to be, gets internet and parts of the world that don't have it. And you guys can now provide therapy services there. Like then that's a whole nother game changer too, which could be cool. Yeah. But I think you're right. There is something for in person. I mean, even currently we have some clients that they couldn't, they'd have to see us in person because it's not safe at home. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're never going to, I think it will never be, totally one or the other it, it it has to be a hybrid somehow but mm. how you know what your goals are and where you're you know how we'll have to see how that yeah plays yeah. out yeah i mean it's interesting too i think uh, i was reading this article this was a few few months ago and they said, said essentially that in the hot part of the world um when you start earning ten thousand dollars you generally get an air conditioner and my new theory is if you start earning 
$40,000, you get a therapist. And there's kind of this, it's the new gym membership in the West. And with the rising middle class in Africa, Middle East, and Asia, mm-hmm. I think once people get whatever the number is, I don't even know what it is, when, when mental health seems to matter, where there's not so much scarcity in terms of their living situation or in terms of food or in terms of whatever, they're going to be this, this cultural narrative of mental health. And it's kind of moving away from yeah. this category of illness to this kind of continuum of health. Like they're starting to integrate mental health into like yeah. physical health, diet, and all that kind of stuff. And it's some, some of the stigma is removed, but I think it's interesting. Like, let's say for instance, a culture like Vietnam who has come from desperation of poverty mm-hmm. and it's grown so much in terms. And, and I, and my guess is, is that once the median income gets X, Y, or Z, then, then it would, it would make sense for us to begin to, you know, if, if we were that sophisticated to begin yeah. to say, okay, how can we serve Vietnam? Well, it's cool to think of that shift happening too, just for those, like when you look at just the, we'll say the history of imperialization into like humanitarian aid into like, you know, white Western savior version of that into like shift. And now it's developing or developed. And then there's this rising middle class. Like, that's just a really positive piece of that narrative. There's a lot of negative pieces and a lot of positive, and it's like a whole, another whole podcast episode, like I said, but I think that's a cool, <laughs> cool piece where we're saying, wow, like that's pretty awesome that it's gotten to that point. So, and I'm excited about your guys' part in that, what you're doing. So um, yeah, I mean, I thank you guys, I guess uh, wrapping up a little bit, like how can people get in touch or support you guys in any way, whether that's an introduction, you know, if someone's listening to this, it's, at a university or someone's at a church or someone's anything in between, like what's the best way people can get involved and support you guys and what you're doing? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, community counseling, um, is kind of the first place counseling with two L's. Yeah. British spelling is counseling with two L's. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, <clears throat> there's, then you can reach out to us in terms of that, but yeah, I mean, we would love to have more counselors. We'd obviously um, as, as our clients become more international, I think for a lot of people that are training, it could be helpful too, that they're just interested in working with a diverse background of people that have different cultural backgrounds mm-hmm. as well. But if you want to, um, move to London or reach out to us over email, or, or there's a donate tab in terms of, um, the link in terms of the website, those are all very welcome. But I think at the end of the day, Charity and myself, we don't want to be, you know, as you said, the sa- the savior of Vietnam, or we don't want to be, we, we want to be a part about equipping and empowering others to do the work. I mean, in a lot of ways, we, we only have a few tricks that we can do, and we would rather really invest in kind of the next generation of counselors and people that are going to be more fluent culturally in both their own and, and to be able to translate that into other, uh, other spheres. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And we'll, we'll obviously link to your guys' website and all that stuff in the, in the show notes. So yeah, th- guys, thanks for what you're doing. It's awesome. I'm, I'm excited people like you guys are out there with your heart to do this stuff and thanks for sharing your story and all your thoughts on the, on the podcast. It was fun. Thanks, thanks for, for having, having us. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. Right. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to another week of the Feast Over Famine podcast. We are so thankful you guys are here and listening. As always, hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast listening apps. Uh, We would love to keep you guys up to date on new episodes that are coming out when we're launching new episodes and we're launching new seasons uh, and everything in between. So uh, when we're in season, episodes are dropping every single Wednesday. Hit that subscribe button. Make sure you're up to date. Also, uh, if you're loving what we're doing, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, where we're constantly posting about our projects, what they're doing, uh, what kinds of things we're working on. We'll recycle some uh, podcasts, uh, things about our partners, all sorts of fun stuff that you want to see. So hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all that kind of stuff and check out what we're doing there. And yeah, we're stoked that you guys are listening. We hope this has been really fruitful and we will catch you guys next week. And lastly, uh, as you guys all know, we always talk about all sorts of things with impact investing, uh, investment opportunities, entity structure modeling, how projects are getting capital. And as a disclaimer and a reminder, Feast Over Famine does not provide legal tax accounting or other professional advice. 
You should consult professional advisors concerning the legal, tax, or accounting consequences of any activities related to your project or a project you're supporting. Feast Over Famine doesn't consult, advise, or assist with the offer or sale of securities in any capital raising transaction. We don't do that for the direct or indirect promotion or maintenance of a market for any securities. Uh, and Feast Over Famine does not engage in any activities for which an investment advisor's registration or license is required under the U.S. Investment Advisors Act of 1940 or under any other applicable federal or federal, federal or state law or for which a broker's or dealer's registration or license is required under the U.S. Securities Exchange Act of 1934 or under any other applicable federal or state law. So there's your investment disclaimer. Uh, hopefully that's helpful if you need it. And if you ever have any questions on that side of things, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Take care.